That which can be claimed without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. It's called Hitchens Razor. And for the past several years, we've heard this story about YouTube radicalization. Just the other day, I did a long segment talking about YouTube radicalization and also the difficulty of trying to classify what someone is politically. One of the most interesting things about this new uh, research on YouTube is that most people tend to be anti something and not pro something. I found that interesting. I guess we're all kind of pessimists. But you heard the story I told you yesterday. YouTube actually steers people away from radical videos, researchers say. We now have two academic studies providing evidence that YouTube is in fact not a radicalization engine as the mainstream media has tried to purport. However, strangely, many journalists are actively trying to debunk the story without evidence, having presented none in the first place. Perhaps it's because it goes against their industry and perhaps because it it goes against their politics. I want to show you this story first from CNBC. But for the longest time, we've seen stories like this. How YouTube serves as the content engine of the dark side, YouTube's secret uh, radicalization for the right, how YouTube built a radicalization machine. None of this is true. None of it's true. And we now have two studies that basically prove it. I won't bury the lead for you. Essentially, they found that what's really happening is it's supply and demand market economics in terms of ideas. People choose to watch what they already kind of agree with and then seek out what they want. People who like pizza tend to buy pizza. People who like Superman tend to watch videos about Superman, and people who are conservative are more likely to watch conservative content. But what all of these stories missed is one simple basic bit of math. Most content produced is either politically left or slightly to the left. That's just the way it is. And that means if you're looking at YouTube content, you might watch someone like Jimmy Kimmel. Jimmy Kimmel is not overtly political, but when he does tell jokes, it is not conservative. That means if you watch anything on YouTube, because most content skews slightly in this direction, you are more likely to go towards the left than you are to the center or to the right. But it served these outlets in two ways. You can notice that some of these are opinion, opinion, just thoughts, just what someone thinks, an expert's opinion, no real data. You see, there are two things being served here. The partisan politics of some of these websites like Motherboard, The Daily Beast, and BuzzFeed, and Columbia Journalism Review, who are overtly liberal, and The New York Times, which leans to the left. When they say YouTube is fueling the far right, it benefits them politically because then YouTube is scared into action. YouTube then takes action, and they did. The other thing it does is it protects the mainstream media. It forced YouTube, and YouTube did this, to then start directing content to mainstream news channels, the greatest recipient, Fox News. Now, I know I'm just rehashing what I told you yesterday, but here's what I, try, I, I find truly fascinating. First, in this story from CNBC, which basically tells you what I said, YouTube is actually steering people away from radical videos. We can see New York Times writer Kevin Roos saying, the premise of this article study is so odd. Studying the YouTube algo of late 2019, after YouTube made some very well-publicized algo changes to reduce recommendations of extreme content, doesn't say anything about what YouTube recommendations were like before then. What's interesting is, once again, Kevin Roos is presenting a point without evidence. I don't know if they do it on purpose. In my opinion, journalism is just dead and nobody does any research. Well, if Kevin Roos bothered to actually read the report, they, they claim that much of the analysis of the latest recommendation algorithm goes back to 2018, well before the algorithm change. More importantly, some, a lot of the data collected, in, because there's different lists, goes back to the beginning of the channel. Look at this, the Jimmy Dore Show. Relevant daily views from 12 December 2012 to 19 December 2019, substantially before the algorithm change. Now, here's what's fascinating. In their effort to claim there was a great radicalization engine, they have inadvertently forced YouTube to make major changes, which for some reason now makes it so that if you watch Jimmy Dore, who is a social Democrat, maybe socialist, Jimmy, I'm not trying to mislabel you, but big Bernie fan, Tulsi fan, you watch his channel, you're now going to Fox News. How does that make sense? You know, you, 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 might th- you might say that proves it's a radicalization engine, but in fact, it doesn't. It literally makes no sense why somebody would watch Jimmy Dore and then want to watch Fox News. Yet that's what they created after the fact, based on what they're saying. But I bring you now to how the media responds. And, you know, 
I, I never liked dragging people personally, but this was rather shocking to see from Julia Alexander and Taylor Lorenz. I think Julia has done some pretty good work in the past. I'm not super familiar with a lot of what she's done. I know she's been criticized. Taylor Lorenz has been criticized before, but she actually tends to do better than most people. And I've actually publicly praised some of the reporting she's done because she avoided a lot of this fake narrative. Now it seems like they're getting on board and saying this. Julia Alexander tweets, hey, a quick request. Journalist friends, don't write about the YouTube report going around, but if you do, please reach out to anyone who covers this space on a daily or regular basis and other academics to understand why the data collection process is flawed. In fact, the data collection process is not flawed. Like any other academic paper, this paper from Mark Ledwich and um, Anna, um, uh, let me see if, uh, I'm forgetting her name. It's uh, Zaitsev, sorry. I know, I know who Mark is, I've followed his work before. But anyway, like any academic paper, it lists its limitations, saying, we use an anonymous account to go through each, you know, rabbit holes to see what the recommendation would be. And there's two big arguments that make no sense. First, let me just say, why on God's green earth would a journalist tell someone not to do journalism? That's so weird. Take a look at the report she's criticizing. The CNBC story, which is reporting on the academic research paper, actually shows criticism of it, which is what a good journalist would do. I think it's important to point out, once again, that which can be claimed without evidence can be refuted, refuted without evidence. And as we already know, all of these stories were presented without evidence. It served a traditional corporate media narrative. It's telling YouTube you're bad and trying to scare advertisers. You know what the big problem is? YouTube is spineless. The market is changing. Media is changing. People don't want to watch Fox News, they want to watch me. Why would you send someone who watches Jimmy Dore or my channel to Fox News when they clearly want to watch Jimmy Dore? Because they hold one of the most amazing views of human beings. As noted by Mark Ledwich, he's got a lot of data here, it's really great stuff. But I think what, <laughs> one of my favorite things is this image right here. What you're seeing is the NPC meme. Let me read a little bit from his story. So he goes into the New York Times report about a man named Caleb Kane, who claims to have been radicalized. But he says this, curiously, just as Caleb Kane was radicalized by far right videos, he was also then de-radicalized by left wing ones. Over time, he had, quote, successfully climbed out of a right wing YouTube rabbit hole only to jump into a left wing YouTube rabbit hole. Kevin Roos remarks that. Uh, Kevin Roos remarks that what is most surprising about Mr. Kane's new life on the surface is how similar it feels to his old one. He still watches dozens of YouTube videos every day and hangs on the words of his favorite creators. It is still difficult at times to tell where the YouTube algorithm stops and his personality begins. Mark says, in his own way, Caleb defines what the left-leaning legacy media sees at the, as the archetypal actor in our media, mediatized post-truth era. Someone who completely lacks all critical thinking, consumes an endless stream of online information and dogmatically believes any political position they are told. It's hard not to notice how this meme is symmetrical to the NPC meme created by the online right. NPC stands for non-player character and is someone who has no agency blindly believing left-wing media propaganda. Penn State political scientists Joseph Phillips and Kevin Munger describe this as the zombie bite model of YouTube radicalization, which treats users who watch radical content as infected and that this infection spreads. As they see it, the only reason this theory has any weight is that it implies an obvious policy solution, one which is flattering to the journalists and academics studying the phenomenon. Rather than look for faults in the algorithm, Phillips and Munger propose a supply and demand model of YouTube radicalization. If there is a demand for radical right-wing or left-wing content, the demand will be met with supply regardless of what the algorithm suggests. YouTube, with its low barrier to entry and reliance on video, provides radical political communities with perfect platforms to meet a pre-existing demand. Writers and old media frequently misrepresent YouTube's algorithm and fail to acknowledge that recommendations are only one of many factors determining what people watch and how they wrestle with the new information they consume. I believe their fixation with algorithms and tech comes from subconsciously self-serving motives, a mechanical understanding of radicalization, and a condescending attitude towards the public. It works like this. If only YouTube would change their recommendation algorithm, the alternative media, the racists, cranks, and conspiracy theorists would diminish in power and we would regain our place as the authoritative gatekeepers of knowledge. Old media's war on decentralized media is not limited to misinformation about YouTube's algorithm. I believe this motivation partially explains why this wild piece against free speech and this hit piece on Cenk Uyghur 
found their way into the paper of record. They're making, Mark is making reference right now to Cenk Uger being accused of defending David Duke. It's insane. But I think we're seeing now why progressive media needs to actually get on board with the fake news narrative. You know what, man? They hate Trump so much. Many people, even the Young Turks, were more than happy to stand side by side and walk in lockstep with people who would see them completely destroyed. Well, Donald Trump was the target. First, they came for Trump. Me, I, I think I, for the most part, act on principle. So when I saw this, the lies, the deceit, the censorship, I called it out. Unfortunately, there were many people like the Young Turks who parroted the narrative. And when I confronted Cenk Uger about showing a video with my name while trying to claim this radicalization engine was real, he yelled in my face. He started screaming at me. And I was surprised because I know the guy. Not like I'm good friends with him or anything, but I've been on his show a couple times. And he screamed at me. And now he reaps what he, is, what, what he has sown by defending this narrative, by using it, thinking the enemy of my enemy is my friend. He has now become the target of the smear machine, same as anyone else on YouTube. And you know what? I still defended the guy because what the New York Times did to him is wrong. I can certainly disagree with the Young Turks and Cenk Uger while pointing out simply because they're wrong doesn't mean they, they should be smeared and lied about. I can tell you Cenk was wrong to use that report. I disagree with his use of it. I disagree with his politics. But in no way do I think he would ever defend David Duke. That's ridiculous. And it's unfair for the media to lie about him. It was unfair for, for Jenk to use the fake report, which, which was targeting Dave Rubin, which inadvertently ropes me in because my name was right in the middle. And it's wrong for the New York Times to do the same to him. But here we can see what we get. You see, these journalists, they don't want you to do journalism. And it's the strangest thing. But it's the same thing that I experienced when I was going to Sweden. Donald Trump said at a rally or something, last night in Sweden, you see what happened. So I announced I would go check it out. And I got messages from journalists I know saying, don't do the journalism. Don't do it. Don't go. Strange to me. Why not? Why wouldn't I go do journalism? Because perhaps it's bad for their politics. I think we can see a combination of things here. Over the past several uh, years, decades even, news jobs have been centralized in major cities, especially with the ex expansion of the internet. For some reason, every time I try talking to someone about opening up a studio in the middle of nowhere where they have excellent internet, but there's like, you know, small dying town, everybody wants to live in a big city. Journalists tend to be left-leaning. Conservatives tend to be commentators. And therein lies a huge disparity between the power and what information is produced. More importantly, as these companies see a lot of people in journalism don't want to work in rural areas, they say, let's open an office in New York City, a city that is deep blue. Thus, most of the people they're going to hire are going to be left-leaning. And then they're going to say, we don't report on things that don't support our narrative. Let me make one thing clear. The narrative about YouTube radicalization has never been proven. It has always been conjecture and opinion. And I will show you this again. We can see here in Mark's piece, opinion, New York Times, opinion, New York Times. Their opinion pieces. In fact, one's just asking the question. Yet, it's fact. Yet, these journalists will say, don't cover the academic research papers. They will target anybody who pushes back on their narrative because they have weaponized the media to promote their personal ideologies and their industry. I'm sorry. I think YouTube is losing. YouTube is so desperate to placate the media. They're actually giving up their core business to the It makes no sense. Why would YouTube bend over backwards for, for their competitors? I honestly can't tell you. YouTube controls such a massive amount of advertisements. They could simply say to Pepsi, when Pepsi says, hey, we heard this story, they can say, it's fake. Do you want to advertise with us or not? And if Pepsi says, well, we're not going to do it until you fix us, bye-bye. Guess what? Now Coke is going to be all over YouTube and no one will ever see a Pepsi ad again. Bye-bye. What do you think Pepsi's going to do? Okay, 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 we'll advertise with you. Instead, YouTube cowers, shaking its boots strangely, considering it's a massive platform. But anyway, the main takeaway from this is that for some reason, for some reason, you, you tell me, journalists are trying to lie. They're refusing to cover. They're arguing that people should stop covering an academic paper that disputes their personal political opinion. The reality is this. The data does not suggest YouTube radicalization. The data actually suggests there are, it's, 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 it's nuanced. I'll put it this way. Most Democrats don't talk a whole lot about immigration. They talk about Medicare. They really care, they really care about health care. Conservatives do to a certain extent, but they're more concerned with immigration. That means if you are someone who is interested in health care, you will be radicalized to the left. 
If you are someone who's concerned about immigration, you'll be radicalized to the right. The reality is it's not actually the case. If you go on YouTube and look up immigration videos, you have to choose to watch those videos. And you can choose to put immigration is good in that search bar. The reality is that it's simply a numbers game. Supply and demand will be met. Communities that believe in certain things exist. And that is it. No one is being dragged in any particular extreme direction because it literally makes no sense. And the argument would be that YouTube is quantifying what words are more extreme than other words. The way I always explain it, Imagine if you saw a bunch of Superman extremists walking around. You saw a group of people wearing Superman costumes with hoods walking around and praying to, to, to Clark Kent. Nobody does that. There's no extremism in Superman. You just see more Superman content. The issue is supply and demand. Are there groups of Superman cultists? No. So then no one goes on YouTube and becomes this. Otherwise, the argument would be the tiny fringe faction of Superman cultists would be getting play because you watch too many DC Comics videos. Makes no sense. But it's an easy narrative because they say radicalization. Why are people becoming conservative? Why are they supporting Trump? The reality is they're not. Republicans have always been where they are. Democrats are veering to the far left and the Democrats in the media don't understand they're flying to the far left. So as they move on their train further and further away, sure, it looks like the Republicans are moving, but they aren't. They are not. Republicans are exactly where they've always been, according to the New York Times of all outlets. So I'll tell you this. We're doomed in the sense that as the media collapses, we're supposed to expect an alternative to arise, people like me. But in response to the decay and the collapse of this industry, YouTube bends over backwards to prop up that industry. So we're screwed. These people are becoming more depraved and corrupt. They're becoming more inept. The company is hiring less skilled journalists to accommodate for the fact they don't have any money. And in the end, what happens? YouTube promotes them. YouTube literally promotes the crappy misinformation. As Mark Ledwich notes at the end of his article, he says, we, rely on, we might rely on authoritative sources to set the record straight, dispel falsehoods, and explain the broader context for those who aren't aware. But a New York Times political correspondent in a now corrected article failed to do all of these things. They made no mention of context or the fact that it was sarcastic. They're referring to Jen Uger. Jen Uger sarcastically said David Duke wasn't racist. He was like, oh yeah, right. But the New York Times framed it incorrectly and the story went out. The lie traveled halfway around the world before the, before the truth could strap on his boots. And Mark points out, why should we trust them over literally anyone else? Now, don't get me wrong. There are certainly more authoritative voices. But when the New York Times lies about radicalization, literally in their own story, if you actually read it, you'd be like, that's the opposite of what they claimed. Somehow they still publish the story. They are going to destroy channels like mine, and that'll be the end. And if you think that's not true, you're not paying attention. So stick around, because these news agencies are going to be hiring crappier and crappier writers who do worse work than I do, and then they're going to destroy my channel and prop up the bad writers. That's what they're building. We are doomed. <laughs> I don't see a light at the end of the tunnel. I mean, maybe we'll see what happens, but I don't know what to tell you, man. Don't be surprised, but, I, but I'll tell you this. When journalists start arguing against reporting the facts because it goes against their, their political narrative, yeah, we're in a dystopia. I'll leave it there. Stick around. Next segment's coming up at 4 p.m. at youtube.com slash timcast. It is a different channel, and I will see you all then.